Welcome to an introduction to ethics. My name is Mark Carlton. I'm the instructor for this course. The textbook we're using is Ethics, Theory, and Practice. Its primary author was Jock P. Thoreau. Dr. Thoreau passed away in 2006. His co-author is Keith Craftsman. Chapter 1. The Nature of Morality. An introduction to ethics is a philosophy course. Philosophy literally means the love of wisdom. The search for an answer to the question, what is morality, has been one of the major concerns of philosophy. There are five branches of philosophy. You can think of this as a tree with five separate branches. The first of these branches is metaphysics, the study of the nature of reality. Epistemology is the study of knowledge. Ethics is the study of morality. Aesthetics is the study of the values of art or beauty. And logic is the study of argument and reasoning. Each of these five branches can be considered in their own right, and they often are. But there's a sense in which they all tend to be involved with one another. In the study of ethics, metaphysical questions are going to become important, as are epistemological questions. How can we know? How can we know what is moral? How can we know what is immoral? In metaphysics, the question of whether there is a God or whether there is not a God has enormous implications uh, to the study of ethics. Aesthetics, uh, not so much, but it's involved too. And logic, certainly the authors of our textbook will seek to present logical arguments for their position on various things. And as I analyze their arguments, I'm going to attempt to use good logic as well. And I hope as you participate in this course, uh, you're going to try to be logical in all that you present. I want to begin by defining some terms. A couple of the obvious terms that we're going to need to understand before we proceed into this course are the terms ethics and morality. Our term ethics comes from the Greek term ethos, which normally refers to a person's character, uh, whether a person is a good person or a bad person in their dealings with others and sometimes in the quiet of their own heart. Uh, character, my mother used to tell me, is who you are when no one is looking. Morality comes from a Latin term, moralis. It means customs or manners. And according to our textbook, morality pertains to the relationship between human beings. Now, I believe it pertains to more than just in personal relationships. And, and I think if I had an opportunity to sit down with the authors of our textbook, they would accept my point here because uh, they will explain that they accept at least part of my expanded view of what morality is. But in this textbook, we're going to focus particularly on human relationships, how we relate in a meaningful way with other human beings. The big question in this chapter is what is morality? According to the dictionary, a moral has to do with a discourse, a statement, or a lesson, a literary or other imaginative work or teaching, uh, which gives us a moral lesson. Think of Aesop's fables. There was a story, and then they would end with this. And the moral of this story is, and there would be some life lesson that was somehow communicated to us through the fable. And that is the number one definition for morality, uh, according to uh, the Merriam-Webster Online Dictionary. A second definition is a doctrine or a system of moral conduct. And that is the primary focus of this course. Uh, the plural of that is particular moral principles or rules of conduct. So we're going to be looking at various systems of moral conduct, and the authors of our textbook are going to present one of their own, uh, humanitarian ethics. Uh, we will also be talking about conformity, 
uh, to right ideas of human conduct. And along with that, what is right human conduct? What is wrong human conduct? Epistemological concerns come in here. How do we know? Uh, we all have a sense that we know right from wrong. We have morals. We assume that our moral judgments are correct. How do we know? And then fourth, moral conduct or virtue. And we will uh, be uh, looking at a chapter, chapter four, uh, which deals exclusively with that question. How is it defined? Morality makes claims on our lives. Morality is that voice that says we must do certain things, or there are certain things we must not do, uh, or there are things we ought to do, and there are things we ought not to do. And sometimes these moral claims are stronger than the claims of law. Sometimes our moral conscience forces us to disobey laws that we would come to view as immoral. And sometimes our sense of morality is going to demand that we set aside our self-interests in order to do the right thing. Now, I have a couple of moral heroes that I think illustrate this point. This is Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi was, of course, one of the great men of the 20th century, a man who was willing to put it all on the line and stare down the most powerful empire of his day to gain freedom for his people. And the modern nation of India looks to him as the founding father of their republic, the same way Americans would look to George Washington as the father of their country. Gandhi's life was difficult. Taking on the British Empire was not easy. And he often found himself beaten. He found himself even more often in prison. And finally, he would be assassinated by a Brahmin because Gandhi tried to reform the caste system. He could have chosen an easier path, but he chose a difficult one. Uh, someone might ask Gandhi, why would you do this? It's not really in your self-interest to live the kind of life you're living. Gandhi himself addressed that question. This is what he said. There is a higher court than courts of justice, and that court is the court of conscience. It supersedes all other courts. Here's what the author was talking about when he said, morality makes demands of us, sometimes uh, greater than the demands of law, sometimes greater than the man, demand that we live our lives in the pursuit of our own self-interest. And Gandhi said, there is something higher. What is that higher court? What's conscience? Conscience driven by a morality that forces good men sometimes uh, to say, even if it costs me my life, my health, and everything thing else, I will follow my conscience, uh, no matter what the law says, no matter what the consequence. Another man who felt the call of morality was this man. This, of course, is Martin Luther King Jr., a young minister who led the crusade for equal justice during the 50s and into the 60s until he also lost his life to an assassin's bullet. He was a Christian minister, and uh, as such, he had some explaining to do because Christians, of course, are commanded in scripture to obey the law. And Dr. King, in his efforts to free his people, uh, followed the same path that Gandhi had traveled before him. And it cost him dearly. He found himself disobeying Jim Crow because the laws were unjust. And he found himself one, on one occasion in the Birmingham jail. And he was criticized by other Christian ministers because he was not doing what Christian ministers were supposed to be doing, at least according to many people. 
and he wrote one of the great documents of the 20th century, century, his letter from the Birmingham jail, to explain what he was doing and why he was doing it. This is, is from that document. King wrote, I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One has not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. That is a powerful uh, philosophical statement, and it gives you an idea into King's understanding of the power of morality. If there is a just law, morality says you must obey this. You must do the right thing, uh, regardless of the consequences, even if obeying that just law would not be to your personal advantage. But then he pointed out that law is not always moral. And morality sometimes demands that the moral person uh, disobey the law because the law itself is immoral. Tremendous statement. And we see in both Gandhi and King an example of what the author was talking about. Morality is a powerful thing. It makes demands on us. Demands that are greater than the demands of the law and greater even than the demand that our body sometimes makes. That we satisfy it. That we uh, seek our own best interest. Uh, morality says, no. Sometimes you can't do that. Two more words that you need to understand as we begin this study of ethics and morals, the word amoral and non-moral. Amoral has to do with those individuals who have no moral sense at all. Uh, they are indifferent to right and wrong, even if they understand what it is. The author of our textbook says this term can be applied to very few people. And we're talking here about people who have a, a apparent absence of any sense of right or wrong. The author says this may be caused by physical trauma to the brain, and sometimes that's probably the case. But we're not sure why some people seem to be living their life without conscience. Uh, we call these people psychopaths. Uh, sometimes we refer to sociopaths, a, a different uh, situation, nevertheless, a problem in the conscience. Uh, there's a lot of debate as to why this happens to be uh, the case with some individuals. What is the cause of it? Is it something that's caused by society? Is it something that has to do with an abnormality in the brain? Is it uh, head trauma? Sometimes that does seem to be the case. Whatever the case, uh, studies have shown there are, unfortunately, a lot of these people around. One study I read said one in every hundred persons is a psychopath. Now, that doesn't mean they're all uh, psychopathic murderers, uh, but it means that they're living their life without the restraints of conscience. Uh, some of them uh, may be uh, businessmen, some may be members of the media, uh, Hollywood celebrities. Uh, some of them may be clergy. Uh, some of them may be college professors. Uh, you can find them everywhere. Uh, they just don't think the way the rest of the world thinks. Uh, they are not troubled by conscience. They seem to have no uh, compelling need to be moral. Now, they may know what it is, uh, they may have had uh, some sort of moral education. Maybe they were raised in a very moral environment. Uh, perhaps their family was a religious family, took them to church every week. Uh, perhaps at church, the moral views of the family were reinforced. Uh, 
Uh, they were enculturated in a culture that agreed with many of the main tenets of that religious face understanding of morality. Uh, nevertheless, it didn't take. And they have no desire or compelling need to be a moral person. Now, I have for many years counseled people before I became a a professor here at Colby Community College, I was a pastor. All told, I was a pastor for 40 years before I retired from that particular line of work. And in my experience, I have found that there are individuals who can become amoral, uh, either completely or in some area of their life, by what I would refer to as searing their conscience. Uh, you can perhaps relate to this. Think of something you did, perhaps something, a bad habit that you still have that uh, that you felt guilty about the first time you indulged yourself. I think, for example, something like, uh, like smoking, a bad habit, and perhaps you were told this was wrong. And the first time you snuck around to smoke, you felt very guilty about it. Uh, but perhaps you do it today and you don't even think about it anymore. Uh, the more you participated in this activity, uh, the less and less the voice of your conscience held you back. And finally, uh, the voice of conscience ceased to cry out to you altogether. So in my personal experience, I think uh, people uh, can become amoral in certain areas, perhaps in all areas, not because they were not born with a conscience, but because they have learned to ignore it and they have done this systematically until uh, the conscience, the voice of conscience, no longer uh, is heard by them at all. The next term we want to discuss is the term non-moral. Non-moral refers to those things that exist outside of the realm of morality altogether. We're talking here about inhabit objects that are neither moral or immoral of themselves, uh, but they could be used for immoral purposes. Think, for example, of a kitchen knife. Uh, you can use a knife for all sorts of good purposes. Say you want to have a salad for lunch, you use that knife to slice up the vegetables you're going to put on your salad, and then uh, you rinse the knife or wash the knife, put it away, it has done nothing wrong. A person could also use that same knife, however, to kill someone. So the object itself, the knife, is neither moral or immoral. Uh, so we don't say it's immoral uh, to have a knife, or that knife there is immoral. Uh, no, it, it is something that exists outside of the realm of morality altogether. The authors of our text add, us that, add that many areas of study are in and of themselves neither moral or immoral. Uh, for example, uh, someone might decide, I want to study human evil. Uh, the study of human evil is neither moral or immoral. Uh, it can uh, be a study that uh, then results in immoral or evil actions, uh, but the study itself is not the problem. Morality has been approached from many different angles, and as you would expect, science has had something to say about morality. The scientific approach to morality has most often been used in the social sciences. Uh, like ethics, the social sciences deal with human behavior and conduct. In the social sciences, however, uh, there is more of an objectivity to the study of human behavior. The emphasis in this approach is empirical. What we can learn from observation, the scientific method. Now, even the best scientist, even the most objective scientist, is not able to be completely objective because we all have our biases, and this would be true of a scientist. But scientists do use the discipline. 
that forces them to at least uh, make a, an attempt uh, to set aside their prejudices. And this scientific approach to human behavior uh, tries to be descriptive. Situations are set up, data is collected. The scientist tries to be an objective observer of human behavior and then they write down, they describe what they have observed. In this approach, the observer is not supposed to be making value judgments, although that sometimes slips into the experiments themselves in subtle ways. But the observer is trying not to say, well, this behavior that we are observing here is wrong. This particular behavior is right. Uh, it's just the facts, just what they see. We are going to be looking at philosophical approaches to the subject of ethics, and as long as there have been philosophers, there have been philosophical inquiries into human behavior, morals, and ethics. Philosophers generally have an approach to ethics, which we refer to as normative. Sometimes we speak of this as normative prescriptive. This is a term, another term you need to be aware of. And uh, the reason is it might show up at some point in time on a test. Philosophers, moral philosophers, look at life and they say, what are the norms, the standards of this society? And then they say, well, you know what? I'm going to go beyond the social scientists and I'm going to make a moral judgment. I look at the way things are. I look at the norms of our society and I don't think they're good. I would like to see a new normal. So over here on the left, we have the present norm. And over on the right, we have what the philosopher would like to see. And then the philosophy, or the, uh, the prescriptive aspect of the philosophy, is to say, I have a plan, a theory, as to how we can get from the norm to the new norm. So normative ethics looks at the way things are, makes value judgments, and says it would be better if this would be the way things are. And here's how we get there. Now think of, of uh, Dr. Martin Luther King again. Uh, of course, he was a, uh, a minister, he was a civil rights leader, but think of him for a bit as a normative philosopher because he was that as well, although not in an official sense. He looked at the norms of his day. Jim Crow, he analyzed them and he said, the norms are not moral. And he thought about things and says, what should be the norm? And he says, I think the norm would be a culture in which there would be equal opportunity and equal rights so that ultimately people would be judged by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. How do we get there? Well, of course, that was the struggle for civil rights that uh, was led by Dr. King and others. And he uh, looked at the example of Gandhi and he chose nonviolence and civil disobedience. And he was able, perhaps not to move things to where he wanted them to be. And I would say most of us would agree they're not there yet. But at least he was able to move the ball closer to the goal line than it had been before. Uh, that is normative, prescriptive ethics, the philosophical approach.
There's another philosophical approach to ethics, and that's the analytical approach. Analytical ethics have become popular uh, due to the rise of postmodern theory, uh, and that's been over the last several decades. Analytical ethics doesn't attempt, like the social scientists, to describe what they see, the norm, nor does it officially prescribe a a, a path to change, though there is a path to change within analytical ethics. But analytical ethics begins by examining the language we use when we talk about ethical matters. And the idea is that though we may not be aware of it, the language we use can be a prison and we are kept in that syntactic prison uh, so that we do not challenge the way things are, that we don't question the moral or the societal norms. Analytical ethicists say we need to tear down the bars, and that begins with an analysis of the bars, the barriers that have been placed around us by language itself. And we need to look at the rational foundation for systems of ethics uh, rather than just uh, assume that what we have in our culture is the way things ought to be. Now let's go back to uh, the Jim Crow era. Uh, there was this norm and language was used to keep uh, African Americans in their place. In the South, there were terms that were used by people who would have considered themselves moral uh, Caucasian people. And yet, when you look at the language, it was designed to put down and keep African Americans in a cage from which they could not escape. Uh, the referring uh, to African American men, for example, as boys, and even worse, uh, names were used, of course. There's the infamous N-word. And these words were used. I, I was enculturated in the 50s. I didn't live in the South. But it was not unusual for uh, the use of all sorts of racially charged language to be used uh, by people who I know would have considered themselves to be moral people, people who attended church regularly. Uh, people who considered themselves and were considered pillars of their community. Uh, I would hear uh, such individuals when I was a child uh, telling jokes. Uh, they used to call them uh, color jokes. That was the nice way of referring to these things. He had a TV program, Amos and Andy, uh, that promoted racial stereotypes, and it was a hit program. Uh, no one in white America felt there was anything wrong with this particular program or the language they were using, uh, the things they were doing. An analytical ethicist would have looked and said, don't you realize you, the majority race, have power. And what you have done is you have created a language. Uh, that you use when you discuss racial matters. And the language you use serves as a syntactic prison to keep African Americans in their place. Analytical ethicists have also noticed that uh, our moral language had the effect of keeping women in their place. Uh, the language we used uh, was male-centric. The pronouns we use were male-centric. And so there has been a movement, particularly in academia and in academic writing, to use gender-neutral or general inclusive, gender-inclusive language to try to address uh, 
the situation. Now, here's where there is an agenda, and I would say analytical ethics, even though some would deny it, I, I think it is actually prescriptive. The theory is if I can change the way you talk about things, I can change your attitude and I can change culture without ever entering into an argument with you. Uh, this is what political correctness ultimately is all about. If we can control the language, we have tremendous power to change the culture. The author of our textbook is in favor of a synthetic approach to the examination of our topic. He believes we can take the best from all of these systems and we can form then a reasonable synthesis of ethical views. Now, if you've studied philosophy, you may hear in this an echo of Hegel and his dialectic approach. And without identifying it as such, this is an approach the authors are taking. And they are saying, you know what? Uh, we have approached the subject of ethics scientifically. Uh, we have, from time immemorial, uh, had normative prescriptive philosophers tackle ethical issues. And now we have uh, moved into the area of analytics, perhaps the best approach is to combine the best of all these views. Uh, there's nothing wrong with paying attention to what the social scientists have learned, nor is there anything wrong with considering what the normative prescriptive philosophers have had to say on the subject and the meta-ethical approach, that would be the analytical approach, it has something to say as well. And so the best way of approaching philosophy is not saying we are going to approach it from this angle, this angle, or this angle. Why can we not approach it from all three angles at once, attack the problem on three fronts? The different approaches are not mutually exclusive. And so he says, or they say, our authors, that we should draw on data and results from the experiences, uh, experiences, excuse me, the experiments that have been uh, conducted in the natural, physical, and natural scientists, that we also do need to look at language and the logic behind ethical systems, though sometimes that logic is unspoken. And we then need to take a look at the foundations of various ethical systems. The authors, of course, are uh, philosophers. And what I have here is the beginning of a quote from our textbook. The authors write, finally, ethicists should contribute something toward helping all human beings live with each other more meaningfully and more ethically. And that would be the normative, prescriptive ethicist who is drawing on uh, insights from these other approaches as well. The author goes on to say something very interesting, very self-revealing. If philosophy cannot contribute to this latter imperative, then human ethics will be decided haphazardly either by each individual himself or by unexamined religious pronouncements. This is kind of an important statement. In this statement, the author reveals, or the authors reveal their own prejudices, and we need to talk about them. Uh, they express their hope that philosophy will have some contribution to make to what they refer to here as the latter imperative. What's that? Well, that refers, of course, to the previous sentence, uh, helping human beings live with each other more meaningfully and more ethically. 
uh, they then express a couple of fears. Now, when I'm teaching this class uh, to a classroom, I ask them at this point to find the author's fears. There are two of them. The point they're making here is that if we philosophers cannot come up with something, there may be a problem. Like most people, uh, Thoreau and Kraussman realizes that there's kind of a moral crisis in the West and in our culture in particular. You cannot help but notice this if you're aware of current events. Our culture is terribly divided and that divide is a moral and ethical divide. Uh, people are at each other's throats at the present moment. And Thoreau and Kraussman perhaps saw uh, very early on what we see acting out in our time. And they're saying if we philosophers can't come up with something so that people can live together uh, without tearing each other apart, then we fear that one or two things will happen. Both of them, in their opinion, very harmful. The first is moral anarchy, that each individual will decide for themselves what is right and wrong. Moral anarchy might be something that is very appealing to an individualist who wants maximum human freedom and, and perhaps they are then in favor of anarchy. But it's very doubtful whether a civilization is going to hold together very long if everyone is deciding what is right in their own eyes. Uh, there needs to be a moral consensus, it seems, if you're going to hold together a civilization. And the authors are concerned about moral anarchy. Their other fear is religion. If you're a religious person, you read our textbook, it won't take you long to discover that the authors of our text have very little use for the Western religious tradition. Uh, this does not mean that they are not religious individuals or spiritual individuals. Uh, the last chapter of the textbook makes it fairly clear uh, that they have a real openness to Eastern philosophy and Eastern religion. And in chapter five of our textbook, uh, they make it clear that they are not materialists. They're not approaching the subject of ethics from a completely atheistic standpoint. Uh, but they do have a problem with what they refer to as unexamined religious pronouncements. And as they will unpack that a little bit, they're referring uh, to traditional Judeo-Christian morality. And they have a fear that if a secular approach to morality is not uh, set forth and accepted by the culture, then people may turn back to uh, religion. And they refer to it as unexamined religious pronouncements. Now, as a person whose expertise is in the area of religious philosophy, I would point out that just because someone bases their religious or, or their moral uh, their moral theory on a religious foundation, it does not requ they're not required to have an unexamined foundation. I mean, you can look at the foundation first and then build a pretty nice house upon it. And so it's a little bit of a shot here that if you are basing your morality on religion that somehow your, the religion and the morality that is based on that religion, the pronouncements of that religion, are somehow unexamined. And that isn't necessarily true. Perhaps it would be true in some cases, but it need not be the case. It is possible for a religious person to live an examined life. We come now to morality and its applications. The authors point out that there is a difference between ethics and aesthetics. Aesthetics, to remind you, is, has to do with art, uh, beauty. Why would that enter into the discussion? What point 
are the authors trying to make here? Well, we use our moral language in non-moral contexts. The English language is not as specific as a philosopher would like. So we use terms like good, bad, right, and wrong in non-moral senses. We have a meal and we enjoy the meal. We say that was really good. Or if we go into a restaurant, the meal is bad. We come out of there and we say it's bad, uh, right and wrong. We tell someone you're doing that right. Uh, perhaps they're working a math problem and, and they're doing it correctly. We say that's right. Uh, or we say that's wrong. You're using you're doing that the wrong way. Well, we're not necessarily making a moral judgment when we say such things. And uh, we use the terms good, bad, right, wrong when we're talking about aesthetics. We look at a painting, we say, that's really good. Uh, we're looking perhaps in a, in a museum at a painting, a landscape painting by Constable. And then we go outside and someone is selling a factory produced painting of Elvis on black velvet for $5. And we say, that's not good. Uh, we're really using terms that we use to describe moral things in a non-moral context. Uh, we do this with respect to manners and etiquette as well. We say someone has bad manners. We're not necessarily saying they're an immoral person. Uh, they might be if they're just impolite, but maybe not. Maybe they've never t been taught uh, the social graces. Uh, we talk to someone who seems to have bad manners and we discover that they live a very moral life and that they're an individual of high character. Uh, so we have a problem with language, the English language in particular, in that sometimes the terms we use are overly broad. And uh, so we want to point out that uh, good and bad, right and wrong, are terms we use. And sometimes these terms do not have moral importance. The author talks about religious morality. And he says something here that uh, anyone in the clergy, no matter what clergy that might be, I, I would think other than a Buddhist monk, uh, just about any representative of any of the world's major religions is going to disagree with this statement as it's stated. The authors write, religious morality is concerned with human beings in relationship to a supernatural being. The authors kind of avoid the use of the term God when they refer to God, they uh, prefer to use the term supernatural being. And as I said, uh, it would be hard to find a religious leader of any religious tradition that would agree with this. Now, a, a Buddhist might, because uh, the Buddha saw his insights as practical in the everyday world. He was agnostic. Uh, when it came to the question of the existence of God or any sort of uh, ultimate reality. Uh, he believed that maybe so, maybe not. It's not something that I have knowledge of. And he observed what Buddhists refer to as the noble silence. Uh, but most of the world's religions, East or West, would say, wait, Religion is concerned with more than just a human being's relationship to uh, ultimate reality. Now, I'm using that term to bring in Eastern thought and Eastern religion, because though uh, people in the Hindu tradition, for example, would speak of God, uh, they would not have in mind the same ultimate reality that a Christian or a Jew or a Muslim would have in mind when they use the term God. Uh, so. If we're talking about religion generally and not just the Western religious tradition, all ultimate reality, uh, which all would refer to as God, though they would mean as something different perhaps by their use of that term, all of them would say, wait, wait, 
our religion is concerned with more than just a human being's relationship uh, to the ultimate reality. In fact, they would say, religion is concerned, our religion is concerned with both our relationship in the Western tradition, which is what the author has in mind. Uh, yeah, uh, we are concerned with our relationship to a supreme being or to God, but we're also concerned about our relationship with our fellow human beings because it is our understanding that we cannot be rightly related to God if we are not rightly related to our fellow man. And the authors of our textbook, after having stated that religion is concerned uh, with human relationship with God, acknowledge that the Western religious tradition is concerned with far more than that. On page 10 of our textbook, the authors write, even though the Jewish and Christian ethical system, for example, importune human beings to love and obey God, both faiths in all their divisions and sects have a strong moral message or social message. In fact, perhaps 70 to 90% of their admonitions are directed towards how one human being is to behave towards others. E exactly so. So religious morality is not just concerned with a human being's relationship to uh, a divine being in the author's word or God. Uh, it's much more than that. There is a a vertical uh, aspect to Judeo-Christian morality. We do want to be rightly related to God, but there is also a horizontal aspect to Judeo-Christian morality. We must be uh, rightly related uh, to our fellow human beings Otherwise, we are not rightly related to God. Uh, both Jews and Christians uh, would insist upon this. Uh, Jesus, for example, was asked, what, in your opinion, is the most important commandment in the law? And he answered the question by referring back to the Torah, and he quoted actually two, the first and the second most important commands. The first, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. Second, and he said it's like the first, love your neighbor as yourself. So just want to point out that uh, the authors have a definition of religious morality that is far too narrow. Morality in nature. More and more, it's come to be acknowledged that human beings have a responsibility to the creatures that share this planet with us and to the natural world itself. Uh, we have talked about morality having to do with how we treat one another. And yet we would look at a person that was cruel to animals and we would have no problem saying that that person is immoral and that their actions are immoral because we have come to understand that morality is broader than just uh, interpersonal uh, human relations. And if we came across a company that was dumping toxic waste into the rivers, uh, we would say that is immoral. That is something that is morally wrong. Uh, so, and you could say, well, that has to do with uh, with human relationships because humans are affected by pouring water into the river, and I suppose that case can be made. But even on an individual basis, someone that would just maliciously uh, go to war with the natural world, we would look at that person and say there is something terribly wrong with that person, uh, something immoral. Individual morality, that has to do with your character. 
Are you a good person? Most people would say, well, yeah, I'm a good person. Really, what makes you a good person? As my mother said, who are you when no one is looking? Social morality is concerned with human beings' relationship to one another. And this is the primary focus of our textbook, as we mentioned earlier. And according to the authors of our textbook, this is the most important aspect of uh, morality. Uh, that is certainly what the textbook is about. Now, the authors are going to talk about our responsibility to the other creatures, our moral responsibility to the other creatures who share this planet with us. And the authors of our textbook are going to talk about our responsibility to the natural world. But the focus of this textbook and the focus of this course is on social morality. Uh, as someone who uh, comes from a religious background, uh, the philosophy of religion is uh, my thing when it comes to philosophy. I might disagree with him and say religious-based morality is the most important category. Uh, and that might make for an interesting discussion between the authors of the textbook and myself. But for the purpose of this course, we are going to focus primarily on social morality. Who is morally responsible or ethically responsible? At the present time, the authors write, only human beings can be considered to be moral or immoral, and therefore only humans should be considered morally responsible. For example, let's say there is an animal that's on the endangered species list and it's living on a wildlife uh, refuge. And there's a lion that sees that endangered animal and it goes after it, takes it down, kills it, and eats it. Uh, we would not say that that lion is immoral. Uh, the lion is ask, acting on instincts and, and moral considerations don't enter into the lion's thinking. Uh, a human being, however, who would take out that endangered animal, kill it and eat, eat it, uh, we would say, you know, that is morally irresponsible. It's morally reprehensible. What's the difference? The lion can do it. Why can't we? Well, human beings seem to have this unique moral sense we talked about earlier, the sense that we ought not to do certain things that we ought to do certain other things. And so this moral sensibility, this moral sense is one of the unique things about uh, uh, human beings. We think differently than the other creatures that share this planet with us. And we're not just talking about that we are smarter, uh, that we can develop technologies and so forth. But we think in moral categories. And as nearly as we can determine, human beings always have thought in moral categories. There is some belief that in the future, some animals will be taught to be moral. What are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about recombining uh, DNA, something we'll uh, discuss later in this course. And, Human animal crimeas are being made and uh, more are being contemplated. Might at some point a animal human hybrid uh, be developed that has this moral sensibility, some new creature? Uh, we wouldn't call it human because it's not completely human. We wouldn't call it a tiger, for example because it's not uh, completely tiger. It's a, it's a combination of the two. It's, it's something completely new. Uh, tigonoids or something of that nature. But such a being might be morally accountable if they have moral sensibility. Let's talk now about the subjective view of morality. It's the opposite of the objective view. It doesn't assume the existence 
of a supernatural does not assume the existence of God. It tends to be materialistic. And in a, opposition to the objective views we've discussed, some, perhaps most, that hold a subjective opinion would believe that morality is a human invention. That if there were not human beings, there would be no morality. Morality does not come from outside us, from God or from any sort of supernatural source. Rather, human beings to live together in society came up with rules and eventually those who kept the rules came to be seen as moral and those who broke the rules came to be seen as immoral. And these moral rules uh, vary from culture to culture, society to society, age to age. Uh, the same would be true of values. They would say that uh, it is the human, the king of the beast, who assigns value to things. Why is a diamond valuable and a piece of quartz not considered equally valuable? Well, it's because we human beings have valued, chosen to value the diamond over the simple quartz. Uh, why is one tropical fish considered to be worth hundreds, maybe even thousands of dollars, uh, while the guppies you feed to that fish are considered uh, virtually worthless? Who determines that? Well, we determine that. Something is valuable, so says the subjectivist, because we have declared it to be so. Without us, nothing would be of value. Uh, without us, there would be no morality. We invented it. The author offers extensive criticisms of the objective view. As you have discovered, perhaps in your reading already, and as you will discover as you continue to read, the authors don't think very much of the Western, the Judeo-Christian moral tradition. Our textbook asserts that it is difficult to prove conclusively the existence of any supernatural being or to prove that values exist outside the natural world. So the first criticism they offer is, if there is a God, the existence of God cannot be conclusively proven. Or, since you cannot prove there is a God, it's difficult to prove that anything else uh, has value were it not for us being there to value it. Well, let me respond to this. Again, this is in my wheelhouse. My uh, particular expertise is in the area of religious philosophy. Uh, so let me unpack this a little bit. It is impossible to prove conclusively anything. It is impossible to prove conclusively that you exist. You say, what? What? I'm thinking. I think, therefore, I am. Haven't you ever read Descartes? Indeed, I have. But Descartes lived before the age of artificial intelligence and computers. Imagine this with me. Imagine that at some point in the future, we're able to create a, a computer game, a, a computer-generated world, and the avatars that we create actually think they exist. Uh, they don't realize they've been completely programmed by us, and we have a joystick, and we can especially, with our computer and our joystick, control the thoughts and actions of one of these avatars. But that avatar thinks it's alive. It thinks it exists. Uh, it thinks it is thinking. Uh, it has the sense that it is thinking. It has been programmed so that it has a self-awareness. Uh, but if the computer is turned off, uh, it goes away. Does that avatar really exist? 
even though it's been programmed to think it exists? How do you know that you are not such an avatar? Uh, could be, right? This could all be a computer simulation. This could all be a holographic world we are living in. And we could think that we exist. We can think that we're thinking. And, and in fact, we don't actually exist. Can you prove that's not true? Can you prove that you exist? You know, scientists don't claim that they can conclusively prove anything. For example, if you were to call a scientist into a court of law and ask his opinion on some matter, uh, you wouldn't say, Dr. Smith, has this been conclusively proven? Because if he's a good scientist, he would say, we don't, as scientists think in those kind of terms. So how would you ask the question? Well, the attorney would say, uh, Dr. Smith, do you have an opinion here on this matter to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty? Dr. Smith would say yes, and then the attorney would say, Dr. Smith, what is that opinion? Uh, they would say to a reasonable degree of scientific certainty, because there's always an understanding that what is uh, science today may be obsolete tomorrow. The science textbook of today will be obsolete 10 years from now, because our knowledge is growing exponentially. And we look at some of the scientific theories of the past, which were considered settled science in the day. And we now know that it was just, they were just wrong. Uh, scientists have learned uh, to be a little more modest in their truth claims. And uh, there is no such thing ultimately as settled science. You hear that term sometimes in the media, but scientifically speaking, everything is open uh, to new input, new information, additional insight. So when the authors of our textbook say we can't believe in God because we can't prove his existence conclusively, uh, so what? You can't prove anything conclusively. On the other hand, someone could make a pretty strong case for the existence of God. They could present evidence uh, that the jury could then decide whether or not they want to accept or not. But ultimately, uh, nothing in this world can be conclusively proven. So our author is holding the objectivists to a ridiculously high standard. The authors also would say, based on what they've just say, said, that uh, since you can't prove the existence of God, then any moral theory based on the existence of God is solely a matter of faith. And so they conclude uh, that we must approach ethics uh, with a no God allowed sign uh, or a no God allowed t-shirt uh, because, uh, you know, we're talking ethics here. And the authors are subjectivists. They believe that ethics, as we will see, are a human invention. So since we can't prove God exists, let's leave him out of the moral equation. Well, I would counter this as someone who has a background in a religious philosophy. Since you cannot prove that we exist, perhaps we should leave human, human beings out of the moral equation as well. Uh, neither can be conclusively proven, although you could make a good logical and perhaps a compelling uh, case for the existence of both God and humankind. Even though you cannot prove anything conclusively, including the existence of, uh, of God, we normally accept a lesser standard of proof. Uh, in courts of law and in our personal life. And so if we take the author's logic to its conclusion, uh, since we cannot prove conclusively the existence of God and we cannot prove the existence of anything, 
we would, I guess, have to just sit here and do nothing. Actually, you wouldn't sit. Can I trust this chair? When I walked into my office this morning, did I know for certain that this chair would hold me? I've sat in chairs before that have fallen apart under my weight. Uh, but, you know, a lesser standard of proof is acceptable. I've sat in this chair enough uh, over long periods of time, over many days. Uh, I've had enough evidence that I accept the proposition that the chair is going to hold me today. Uh, courts of law. They don't ask for conclusive proof, even in a capital offense. When someone's life is on the line, our courts of law only require proof beyond a reasonable doubt. And in lesser lawsuits, an even lower standard of proof is acceptable. A preponderance of the evidence, more likely than not. And so the author says, we cannot accept any sort of religious-based morality because it's Founding assumption, its foundational assumption, cannot be conclusively proved. Well, uh, what can? Interestingly, later in our textbook, the authors are going to present their own moral theory, and in doing so, they are going to acknowledge that their theory is based on assumptions that cannot be be, quote, conclusively proven. And yet they're going to argue that we should accept their moral theory. Hmm. Interesting. We cannot accept the objective theory of morality because its foundational assumption that God exists cannot be proven conclusively. But we should accept the author's humanitarian ethics, even though they acknowledge that it's based on assumptions that cannot be conclusively proven. Uh, could we have perhaps a consistent standard here? Just asking. The author, authors also assert, as we pointed out, that religious-based morality is based only on faith. In fact, that's just not true. Uh, throughout uh, the last uh, 1400 years ago, some of the most profound moral philosophy we have, and the logic to defend it, has come from religious believers and is based on their assumption that there is a God. For example, later in the course, uh, the authors are going to talk about the, uh, the morality of war. Good subject. And they're going to reference the just war theory. Well, that theory was developed by Thomas Aquinas, a religious believer. The entire Catholic theological system is largely based on his uh, philosophically based theological system, which is based uh, largely on, on the philosophical system of the great Aristotle. So, yeah, they start from the assumption there is a God, and that is the beginning point of their reasoning process. That's their foundational assumption. But it does not mean, then, that everything they would assert is going to require blind faith in order to believe it. The authors start building their rational case on another unproven assumption. And the authors will later admit that that's kind of the way rational thought works. All rational thought is based on unproven assumptions. If you trace it back far enough, whoever you're talking to assumes something to be true. It's not something they can prove, it's an assumption. What makes the faith-based assumption, the objective assumption, less logical than the subjective assumption? Well, neither one is better than the other because they are just that, assumptions. Let's return again to our textbook and the 
criticisms that the author has of the objective view. The authors assert that the diversity of religious traditions makes it unclear which values are the best and why. The argument here is we have all these religious traditions. They all teach something different when it comes to morality. Whose morals are we going to go with? Which religion are we going to go with if we say that religion can serve as a foundational for as a foundation for moral reasoning? Well, the problem with this argument is it's a straw man. If you actually study the world's religions, you're going to be amazed at the unanimity among them when it comes to matters of basic morality. This is why a lot of people have looked at world religion and they have said they all teach pretty much the same thing. Now, that is really not true. Uh, the various religions of the world teach very different things. But when it comes to basic morality, they are in virtual agreement. This is why it is possible for us to travel to another culture and uh, be able to interact in a meaningful way with the people that are there. Uh, the author says morality, uh, you know, we want to interact meaningfully and ethically with other human beings. We can do that because there is a general agreed upon set of moral rules that are, are cross-cultural. Uh, I know this from personal experience. I have had the privilege of spending a lot of time in India. I have close friends in India and uh, they treat me well. They treat me morally. They treat me ethically. And if someone were to not treat me that way, they would have guilt about it. It's just not true that we have all these religions teaching different things when it comes to morals and ethics. They don't. As a matter of fact, uh, we could refer to the general moral consensus that exists among uh, the various religions of the world as a tradition, shared tradition. And this is why uh, this type of morality, objective morality, is often referred to as traditional morality. And in the world of philosophy, when you speak of traditional morality or traditional worldview, you're talking about a religious worldview. And so the debate is really not between the religions as to what is right and wrong. They kind of agree on that. The debate in our time is between the traditional religious worldview and one that has developed really in the modern age, the secular and scientism worldview. And these two uh, worldviews represent the moral divide that we talked about earlier are the source of the moral conflict in our times and in our culture. So you have traditionalists versus secularists. Now, our author prefers a secular approach to morality. Okay, I can respect that. Certainly want to listen to what he has to say. But the fact that the author prefers the one does not mean that a case cannot be made for the other. We sometimes assume that. We have an opinion, we hold to it uh, with absolute certainty. And we assume that those who disagree with us are, are just wrong, that logic and light are ours. And anyone who doesn't agree with us is obviously illogical and unenlightened. That's just not true. Uh, you can make good logical cases for both sides of practically any debate. And so the authors want to dismiss the objective view, and so they're going to critique it strongly here and later in the textbook. Uh, but when you listen to what the other side is saying, uh, you find out that there are powerful arguments for the other side of the debate. And if you're interested in this, I'd like to recommend a book to you. It's a book called Why Religion Matters by one of the great uh, religious uh, philosophers of our time, Huston Smith. Let me repeat the name of that book. Huston Smith is the author and the name of the book is Why Religion Matters. If you're interested in further discussion of, of this and other points, I really recommend that book to you. 
Well, let me offer an additional rebuttal uh, of the author's critique of objectivism. 84% of the world's people still live in traditional cultures, still hold to a supernatural view of morality. That's a lot of people. Now, the figure I just gave you uh, represents the most recent studies conducted worldwide by the Pew Foundation. And the number is actually 16.3. I've rounded down. 84% of the world's peoples are traditional. Uh, they're religious. And as such, they would have a shared view of what is basically moral and immoral. 16% of the world, 16.3% of the world, would now be identified as secular. They would hold a scientism worldview. That is not scientific. Scientism would be materialistic, more or less atheistic. Uh, not all secularists would be atheists, but uh, that would be just a, a general description. This pie chart illustrates it. Our authors, the authors of our textbook, would be in that blue group. They would be among the 16.3%, as would be most of academia, by the way. Most of the professors you have had or will have would come from this point of view. Now, to argue, as our authors do, that the theories which represent the thinking of just 16.3% of the world. And these values are primarily Western. And to suggest that these views replace the moral foundations of the other 84% of the world's peoples is, at the very least, a little undemocratic. If you put it to a vote, I don't think our authors would win that election. And it's arguably a form of cultural imperialism. Once again, the West trying to force its views on the rest of the world. And certainly in the traditional world, that's how the secular approaches to morality are increasingly viewed. Another criticism of the objective view that the authors of our textbook offer is the uh, the protest, really, that atheists can be moral. And my response to that is, duh, so what? And religious believers can and often are immoral. Our moral choices can be logical. They can be illogical. An atheist can be moral. An atheist can be immoral. A religious believer can be moral. He can be immoral. Uh, who's saying that an atheist cannot be moral? The argument is, a, again, a bit of a straw man. No one is arguing this. I mentioned that I had been a Christian minister for 40 years, and I've had a lot of atheist friends in that time. And I can tell you that some of my atheist friends, as a matter of fact, I'll say all of those who became friends were individuals of high morality and integrity, more so than some of the people that I pastored, people that were members of my church. I would have trusted many of my atheist friends far sooner than I would have trusted many of my Christian friends. Uh, one of these friends of mine referred to uh, some of the Christians he knew as churchians, uh, meaning they go to church. But what comes down to it, they're not good people. Hey, that happens. Uh, morality uh, is something, and that moral instinct, uh, that a person can choose to respond to or not, uh, in spite of their theological opinion. Uh, the authors also take on natural law theory. They argue that there's no conclusive evidence that natural moral law exists. And again, there's that conclusive thing. Uh, that's an observation, not an argument. Uh, certainly, you can't prove 
that natural law theory exists. You can't prove anything conclusively. However, uh, there is a growing body of scientific evidence that can be interpreted as favoring natural law theory. And I, I want to make you aware of that. One of the individuals popularizing this new data is this man, Jonathan Haidt. Uh, Dr. Haidt, a professor at the University of Virginia. He is an evolutionary and moral psychologist and philosopher. Haidt has written a best-selling book entitled The Righteous Mind, uh, why Good People Are Divided on Politics and Religion. I'm going to be quoting from this book uh, throughout the course. And uh, if you were taking this on campus, you would require, be required to read and write an analysis of this book. But in the online course, we're not requiring that. Importantly, Hay is not a religious believer. He, in fact, is an atheist. And he would no doubt object to being called an advocate of natural law theory because he's not. Uh, he identifies himself as an intuitionist, and this is a moral theory we're going to be talking about in chapter three. Uh, nevertheless, there is an interesting intersection between intuitionism and natural law theory. And when you think of an intersection, think of roads that intersect. Uh, both of these theories have something in common. Haight calls his theory the moral foundation theory. And it's based on extensive research into morality. And this research has been conducted in a variety of cultures. Uh, this research has identified six foundations or intuitions that we seem to be born with that underlie morality in all societies and in every individual. Haight uh, has named these six moral instincts or intuitions or foundations by using pairs of opposite to show that they provide a continuum. Uh, there's the hair, uh, hair, the care, harm for others, uh, moral foundation or intuition. Uh, there is the liberty oppression, intuition, instinct. Turns out that no one wants to be tyrannized. No one wants to be uh, a slave. We tend to appreciate those people who are the liberators. Uh, fairness, cheating, justice. Uh, turns out that no one wants to be treated unjustly. Loyalty, betrayal. It would seem that the Benedict Arnolds of this world are not popular in any culture or in any age. The authority subversion tradition, uh, respect, tends to be a human moral instinct. And then finally, sanctity degradation and uh, purity uh, versus impurity. These seem to be innate moral instincts. Well, how does this view from of hate differ from natural law theory? Well, hate's moral foundation theory is based on recent scientific and psychological data. And it has been discovered that we are all apparently born with some basic moral intuitions, instincts. A natural law theory says the same thing. And it too is based on observation, but it is more of a philosophical and a theological argument. Uh, moral foundations theory has taken the discussion about as far as it can go based on the evidence, although hate goes beyond just uh, the evidence and he becomes a normative, prescriptive uh, philosopher in his own right. Natural law theorists uh, look at the evidence and really like hey they draw some inferences that go beyond that which can be empirically verified it basically comes down to uh, this hate has said we are born righteous but we have to learn exactly what people like us should be righteous about here's an illustration we're like a house 
that's pre-wired, ready for the fixtures to be put in. Society puts in the fixtures, but hates ideas that were pre-wired to be moral, were born to be righteous, and natural law theory would agree with that. So how do they differ? The identity of the electrician. Hate believes the electrician was natural selection. Someone who holds to natural law theory would believe that the electrician is God, but both would agree that the wiring is there. Well, the authors do offer some criticism of the subjective view, not much because they themselves are subjectivists. According to the authors, there are some odd things in the world like art, science, politics, music, that are only valued by human beings. And again, he leaves out of the equation that there might be a, a supernatural being who would also value these things. Uh, he starts with the assumption that that being is unprovable and therefore irrelevant. But then the authors go on to say there are many other things that are valuable whether human beings are around or not. And you would say this is very similar to the objective view, but what would they be? If there are no human beings, what would be valuable? Well, the authors are going to unpack this later. Well, what they are referring to here are the other creatures uh, that share this planet with us. They value certain aspects of the natural world too. So it's argued that they also have rights. Uh, the author says values are determined by three variables. Uh, first, there has to be something that is valued. Then there has to be a valuer. And uh, there has to be a context in which the thing is valued. Now notice they don't say that there has to be a human being. There just has to be a conscious being. And this is why uh, they believe there are things in the natural world that would be valuable whether we are here or not, because we are not the only beings on this planet who are conscious and aware of our own existence. Uh, we share the planet with any number of conscious beings. They may not have the same level of sentience that we do, but they are nevertheless valuers. And so if we did not exist, the natural world would still be a thing of value to everything else that shares this planet with us. Well, this lecture has gone on for about an hour and a half. That's a long time. Uh, we're going to end it at this point, and we will continue to work our way through chapter one in the next lecture. Give you a little bit of a break. Uh, not all of the lectures are going to be this long. Uh, some of them will be long because in these early chapters, as we're breaking down the textbook and trying to help those of you who are not from a philosophical background to understand what is being said, what it means, it may take a, a little more time. Uh, the lectures will become progressively shorter as we go along. Uh, but this would be a good point to take a break. And uh, so we will pick up at this point in the next lecture.